This week on Vaticano, the city of Rome celebrates the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Come with us to this tiny Roman square to witness a beautiful tradition that the Roman Pontiff performs every year. The Vatican Museums host two exceptional exhibitions. The Egyptian Department hosts the 3,500-year-old Royal Statue of Amenhotep II, and the Braccio Carlo Magno Gallery welcomes masterpieces of Russian art brought by the Trechikov Gallery. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Following a tradition established by his predecessors on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, Pope Francis crossed town to get to a little Roman square just off the Spanish steps to offer a wreath of flowers to a statue of the Virgin Mary. Standing beneath the column of the Immaculate Conception, the Holy Father entrusted all priests, religious and Catholic families from the Diocese of Rome to Our Lady. Every year on December 8th, the City of Rome's firefighters are in charge of placing a wreath over the right arm of the Statue of the Virgin. The feast was officially established by the Vatican in 1854, when Pope Pius IX confirmed the dogma of the Immaculate Conception. According to this teaching, all humans are born with original sin, but Mary was immaculate from the moment of her conception because God chose her and prepared her to become the mother of Jesus, the mother of God. In Italy, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception is also a national holiday. After honoring the statue, the Holy Father visited the headquarters of the Roman newspaper Il Messaggero that celebrated its 140th anniversary this year. Addressing the employees, the Pope confessed that Il Messaggero is the only newspaper he reads, even though many people have apparently advised him not to. After imparting his blessing, Pope Francis was given a plaque showcasing a front-page interview he gave the paper in 2014. As part of the Pope's Mercy Friday initiatives, the Holy Father made two surprise visits to underprivileged sick people in Rome at the beginning of December. Casa Mica is a home for people with chronic illnesses who need ongoing medical care. Following that visit, the Pope then went to a rehab center called Il Ponte L'Albero. The center hosts 12 young people who suffer from mental illnesses. Mercy Friday is an initiative that the Holy Father instituted during the Jubilee year 2016 to exercise corporal works of mercy. Maria del Carmen de la Peña Corcuera has officially become Spanish ambassador to the Holy See, presenting her credentials to Pope Francis in early December. Mrs. Maria del Carmen was wearing a peineta, a traditional Spanish headdress worn for special occasions. Diplomatic relations between the Holy See and Spain were established in 1480, and it's the oldest permanent diplomatic mission to the Vatican. Pope Francis welcomed Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas to the Vatican. The two leaders discussed relations between Palestinians and Israelis and the positive role that the Catholic Church plays in Palestinian society. Attention was also focused on the status of Jerusalem, underlining the importance of recognizing and preserving its status quo as an international city. The Holy See recognized the state of Palestine in January 2016, while it instituted diplomatic ties with Israel in 1993. Pope Francis is to visit the capital of the United Arab Emirates from February 3rd to 5th next year to take part in an international interfaith meeting on human fraternity in Abu Dhabi. His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi, together with the Catholic Church in the United Arab Emirates, issued the invitation to the Holy Father. The director of the Holy See Press Office, Greg Burke, said peace and cultural encounter will be the central focus of the apostolic visit. The theme of the trip is make me a channel of your peace, and that's really the Pope's intention in going to the uh, United Arab Emirates, how all people of goodwill should be working for peace. This visit shows uh, the fundamental importance that the Pope gives to interreligious dialogue. It's really the perfect example of what he calls uh, the culture of encounter. 
of, of dialoguing with different cultures. The Royal Egyptian statue of Amenhotep II arrives at the Vatican Museums for the first time, having left its permanent home in Turin. The arrival of this ancient artifact is a huge event for Egyptologists, as the director of the Museum of Turin explains. Well, first of all, we are dealing with a royal statue, and it's one of the most impressive royal statues which are preserved from ancient Egypt, and it is normally housed in the Museo Egizio in Turin. Why is it important? Well, first of all, can you imagine a statue from the 14th century BC still almost completely intact? We can go and look at it and see the intimacy of this gesture of the pharaoh kneeling on his knees and holding two new pots, they are called, which are pots used for doing offering to the gods. Alessia Menta, curator of the Vatican Museum's Egyptian department, tells us the presence of the statue completes its collection. The statue fills a gap in the statuary gallery of the New Kingdom in the Vatican collection. And so this collection gathers together the Egyptian antiquities, the ancient Romans brought here to Rome during the time of the empire in the first centuries. They were using them to decorate their homes, and therefore we do not have the statues from the great archaeological excavations. Why do the Vatican museums pay so much attention to preserving ancient pagan artifacts? The church, in this case the Vatican museums, are an open door on the world, as John Paul II said. They are able to gather and welcome all civilizations, and each of these civilizations can transmit a message, a message of dialogue, a dialogue between different cultures, between different countries, from tens of thousands of years and tens of thousands of kilometers away. Museums are not only about preserving material culture, but museums are about doing research. So the fact that the statue is here, and a very important statue in our collections is here, stresses how important the cooperation between our institution is, makes it visible for the public to understand that we are in dialogue, that we work together, that we do research together in order to better understand our collections, and so makes the public realize that these two institutions work together. The Royal Egyptian statue of Amenhotep II will stay within the Vatican walls until June the 30th of next year. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. More on Vaticano begins now. The UN Geneva in September, during the 39th session of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, held a debate on young people, youth, in regards to the enjoyment of all human rights. The Holy See expressed their concern that this generation is living in an environment of instability. This generation is vulnerable to becoming isolated and to lose their sense of belonging to a family, to a homeland, to a culture, to a faith. We spoke with a Catholic youth leader. She emphasized the different age groups and that she believes the most vulnerable is the so-called Generation Z, those born in the mid-1990s to mid-2000s. So in this age group we have what we call uh, toddlers on technology. So from an early age they're using it to um, to mold their lives and to, to sculpt it in ways that none of the other generations have experienced. Um, so they're kind of finding their way in life by using these technologies. And uh, so for them what this looks like is they're on their smartphones about 15 hours a day. Each week it's about 36 hours in front of screens. They get 3,000 texts a month. They're the always-on generation. 
um, and they've actually been able to create an entirely new model, which instead of needing to adapt to something that we have preset, they're building and they're adapting and, and changing. The world economy is not able to create enough quality jobs for young people. Let's talk about the job, what it does, the company that gives them the job. The impact of the jobs, is that also taken into consideration that, the, that their work has an impact some sort of in society? Absolutely, yes. So this age group also, um, they, they think that about, I think it's over 80% want to have an impact in, in our world, which is up from 39% or so of millennials. So even one generation difference, there's this huge jump in wanting to have an impact in the world. BC said that the building of psychological, social, emotional, practical and physical skills and the sharing of values must be essential ingredients of any education. Right, yeah, so I think here is an opportunity to, to bring in apologetics, um, to teach about you know, Thomas Aquinas and his whole causality, you know, rather than looking into the science side and speaking about the, um, you know, where the scientific evidence lies. Well, it was a Catholic priest that actually introduced the Big Bang Theory. So I think people forget that science and faith kind of go hand in hand. So that's really an opportunity for us to say, well, look, this is, this is our opinion. Here's how you can respond to some of these big questions. And, and that makes it easier for us. If it really is a question of science for some of these young people, then we have an answer for that. You know, if it's defending their faith or looking for how we re respond and react to certain issues, then that's an apologetics question that, that we can delve into those issues as well. So in order to boost young people's interest in the church and give them a sense of belonging, how should we invite them? Since technology has become such a big part of their life, that maybe the invitation is, you know, can you, can you make a video, can you explore God's, the wonder and awe, and let's go outside and let's make a, a video about that. Are you a blogger? Can we write something in the church bulletin? So I think the end is, is that question of invitation and, and bringing them in and showing them that this is where you'll find your true belonging, you know, as a child of God and um, being able to, to spread your wings within your faith and to share whichever gifts God has given you. For an inclusive future, we need to consider them as valuable resources rather than a liability. According to the Holy See, it is imperative that future generations inherit a natural environment unspoiled by human greed and devastation, and it's essential that they are not to be robbed of hope and of the chance to employ their idealism and talents in shaping the future of their country and indeed our entire human family. World Youth Day is fast approaching. In about a month, the Holy Father will travel to Panama to meet Catholic youth from all over the world. The theme of this upcoming World Youth Day is taken from the words of the Virgin Mary, I am the servant of the Lord. May it be done unto me according to your word. Archbishop Jose Domingo Mendieta of Panama City explained the events would be focused on three main themes. Grandes temas importantes de esta jornada. Primero, el papel que tiene. Major themes of these World Youth Days will be first, the role of youth in the transformation of the world and of the church. And the same young people will have to reflect. Who am I? What is my mission? What is my vocation? And how can I responsibly assume this transformation? Another great theme will be the care of the earth, our common house. We are all responsible for taking care of this common house that the Lord has placed in our hands. And also another very important theme for the world, but especially for Latin America, is the theme of women in society and in the church. An example of Mary. De la mujer en la sociedad y en la iglesia. A ejemplo de María.
nos hemos puesto en camino hacia la próxima meta que será Dios mediante Panamá en el 19. In his recent video message to young people, Pope Francis invited young people to follow the example of Mary and accept God's plan in their lives. All the latest updates, including the Pope's message, are available on the official website panama2019.pa. To catch up on past World Youth Days, you can visit worldyouthday.com. WorldYouthDay.com was developed by Steve Karakis, a frequent World Youth Day pilgrim. So it started really as my, uh, my personal experience as a pilgrim to the World Youth Day in Denver, which was a transformational experience for me. Um, and then I continued on to the next World Youth Day in Manila, started bringing people, young people, to the World Youth Days after that. Um, and then out of that experience and out of those, um, those other experiences with the young people, we, we started the WorldYouthDay.com as a service to the broader uh, English-speaking world. And so um, it was his example and his lead and his, him going out to the world to reach out to the young people that was so inspiring. And another inspiring thing happened. I, I met a young girl there um, on the very first day and we got married eight months later and we've been married for 24 years. So it's a very personal experience as well. World Youth Day in Panama is going to be a culmination of this year's Synod on Youth as well as the transitional point into next year's Synod of Bishops for the Pan-Amazon region. A week before the official program in Panama, the Indigenous World Youth Day will be held from January the 17th to the 21st. At the end of the meeting in Saloya, the young indigenous participants will continue their pilgrimage to Panama City to join young people from all over the world. I would like everybody to join Panama. Panama is such a wonderful uh, place. I love them. It's not, it's not because it's my country, but we have a lot of things to do, a lot of uh, things to offer to all the people who visit us. Actually, we have a lot of tourists in Panama. I would like to everybody to come and join us to have this testimony of love in, of Jesus Christ to, to come and feel it, to live it, is going to be really fun, I swear. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Fifty-four masterpieces of Russian art traveled for the first time from Moscow's Tretyakov Gallery to Rome. Many of the works of art had never left the Russian capital, but now they're on display at the Vatican, where visitors can view them free of charge from November 20th to February 16th, 2019. One of the first to walk through the Braccio di Carlo Magno gallery was Pope Francis himself, not long after the Vatican Museums inaugurated the exceptional exhibition. Curator Arkady Ipolitov tells us Bernini's architecture guided the genesis and nature of the exhibition, which represents Christ's pilgrimage through Russian art. This exhibition is about the spirituality of God and man, and the relationship between these two concepts, God the man and man the God, concepts that are very important in Russia. The exhibition begins with Christ. On the left, we see the 15th century Desis, which is Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, represented here in his divine essence. On the right, we find the crucifixion, which represents the end of the earthly path, 
and shows that Jesus Christ is also a man. The icons were painted specifically for the liturgy to help the faithful contemplate the mystery of God. The image of the icon is static, pure and uncluttered. There are no movements, just straight lines. They point up to the tender expression of love between God the Son, who at the same time is Father, and His Blessed Mother, who is also His daughter. The silence of John the theologian invites us to contemplate the ineffable mystery of how God the Creator decided to become a creation. That decision is captured poignantly in the painting called Holy Trinity with the story of three angels and Abraham. Although in the 19th century Russian art veered towards realism, the gospel themes didn't disappear. In Life is Everywhere, Nikolai Yaroshenko represents a human drama showing imprisoned people being transported in train carriages. The face of one woman expresses the hope that God will not abandon his people to their misfortune and that mercy, solidarity and joy exist behind bars and behind the painting. Vasily Perov similarly communicates with visitors through his Troika painting. In it he asks, can you tolerate the misery of a child and still be a good Christian? The children's faces are atypical. They shine through with divine grace, granted by another trinity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Even during the years of atheistic rule in Russia, there was a link with the Gospel. The Petrograd Madonna by Kuzma Petrov Vodkin and the Black Square by Kazimir Malevich were inspired in some way by the icons. Конец это не обозначает, и Малевич не висит в конце, в конце все-таки висит икона. Малевич does not mark the end of the exhibition, and it's not the last painting. The icon in the rejoiceth is about Russian synodality. It's the icon linked to paradise that wraps up the display. But Malevich's square is directly connected to iconography. It's located near the apocalypse icon. And when Malevich himself first exhibited it, he placed the black square in the red corner as a replacement for the icon. That was his way of showing the importance of the battle with God in the search for God. <laughs> Boris Kustodiev in the Bolshevik also expresses the battle with God. There is something from Christ in Bolshevik because it's an image of the Antichrist. If you do not confront God, you do not seek Him. And this duality of confrontation and seeking is characteristic of the Russian mentality. This endless struggle is emphasized at the center of the exhibition by an 18th century sculpture from the Perm Museum. Christ in a cell is the only sculpture amid the many icons and paintings. It combines the humanity of Christ with his spiritual nature and becomes a tri-dimensional icon resembling man, the image and the likeness of God. In the same ensemble, there's a portrait of Dostoevsky by Vasily Perov, whose downcast eyes perhaps reflect the beauty that saves the world. This phrase can be explained by another phrase of Dostoevsky's, also referring to the fact that the most beautiful human face in the world is the face of Jesus Christ. It's why Dostoevsky is placed in that corner, near the 18th century Christ in a cell, Kramskoy's Christ in the wilderness, and the icon of the holy Mandelian. When he said that beauty would save the world, Dostoevsky meant precisely the beauty of Christ. He didn't speak of beauty in the ancient pagan sense of beauty, but in the Christian sense. And accordingly, his phrase that the face of God is the most beautiful thing in the world 
explains a lot about him. 